that game was really a privilege for me to play on. Even today, uh, I'm asked for copies of the film uh, all the time. And I, and I used to dream about playing against him. You know, I, I figured we would play against each other that year. The high school game in Texas, it'll be talked about from now on. And it was kind of like our game with Arkansas in 69. They were anticipating a legendary game, and they got it. There may have been other games in the nation as good as the San Antonio Classic, but for the players who participated in it, for the fans who watched it, and the writers who covered it, there is no contest to equal that legendary gridiron combat on a cold November night in 1963. The old Rockyard Alamo Stadium was built in 1938, and in its first 25 years, it had never seen a game like this one, and it hasn't since. It wasn't a football fantasy, but to hear about it, you might have thought it was a gridiron fairy tale. But it was real, and it took place right here at this antiquated arena of action, Alamo Stadium. The Dallas Morning News in 1999 named it the game. They called it the greatest high school football game in Texas of the 20th century. Hi, everybody. I'm Gary DeLon. I'm Linus Bear. And tonight, we're going to revisit those 48 minutes of yesteryear as we turn back the pages of time. Gary, uh, my high school, Robert E. Lee High School, played Brackenridge High School, who at that time was the defending state champion in 4A, Class 4A. And we really thought the winner of that game would probably go on to, to win the crown uh, once again. But uh, that game was really a privilege for me to play on. Even today, uh, I'm asked for copies of the film uh, all the time. And today, we're going to create, recreate uh, a part of that game for you. Yeah, we're going to tear a page out of those scrapbooks of 1963, and we're going to talk about the Robert E. Lee Brackenridge game, and we ask you to join us and come along with us as we take a trip down the time tunnel of sports history. KLIF bulletin from Dallas, three shots were reportedly were fired at the motorcade of President Kennedy today near the downtown section. The nation was stunned a week before when on November 22nd, presidential assassin Lee Harvey Oswald took aim from the school book depository in downtown Dallas and fired the bullets that killed President Kennedy and critically wounded Governor John Connolly. The nation was veiled in a cloak of tears, grief and mourning, and Americans seemed lost, their emotions in a pit of despair. So the Brackenridge Lee game was a diversion from sadness and San Antonians were caught up in the fever of the approaching contest in order to temporarily find a respite from the memory of those tragic Dallas events. 39 years ago since that fantastic game, but in many ways I know it seems like yesterday. Well, it does seem like yesterday. I mean, uh, I think really because the game is talked about so often and everybody uh, that wants a copy of the film, wants to see the film, I think just makes it more of a today event. I guess for high school, that would be put in that same category as the Arkansas-Texas game and the uh, great game with the Hail Mary with Drew and Roger. The, the thing that's made this game live on, I think, is probably because it lived up to the hype of the press. And uh, I mean, it was built up to be a high scoring game, which I didn't think it would be because both teams, I thought, had great defenses. But it lived up to the hype of the press, and I think that's what people remember. Hi, everybody. I'm Gary DeLon, and along with Shannon DeLon, we're here to host one of the best games ever played in San Antonio schoolboy history, and it's been called The Game by the Dallas Morning News. The defending state champion Breckenridge Eagles are 8-2. The Robert E. Lee Volunteers 10-0. This game's going to spotlight wondrous Warren McVeigh of the high-flying Eagles and Robert E. Lee's very own Linus Bear. For McVeigh, he broke all scoring records in San Antonio history, Recording 277 points during the season, he was unstoppable. For Bear, he was a power runner averaging 40 points a game. Join us now for the recreation of the Robert E. Lee Brackenridge game of 1963. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to beautiful Alamo Stadium for tonight's 1963 bi-district playoff game between the visitors, the Robert E. Lee Volunteers, and the home team, the Brackenridge Eagles. This game is the first bi-district playoff game in Texas history to be televised and will be carried on WAI TV and the radio broadcast will be carried on KBAT Radio 680. This game is also a sellout as more than 22,000 tickets have been sold. 
Now let's look at the starting lineups. For the Brackenridge Eagles at guards, Ronald Richardson and Douglas Coffey. Centers, Lewis Pettis. Tackles are Edward Coleman and Albert Davis. The ends are William Hines and Robert Glenn. At quarterback, Henry Ramon. Halfbacks are Wondrous Warren McVeigh and Elmo Washington. Fullback is Floyd Boone. The coach is Weldon Foreign. For the Volunteers, Robert E. Lee Center is Travis Sabera. The guards are Mark Schreiber and Gary Eldridge. The tackles are Bob Burney and Jerry Briggs. The ends are Bill Canepa and Eddie Marquette. Wingback is Bruce Kemp. Quarterback is Gary Kemp. Tailback is Linus Bear. The fullback is Larry Townsend. And coach is Kirk Drew. Linus Bear, number 10, running back. Wilbur Culpepper, number 44, wingback. Travis Sabera, number 50, center. Jerry Briggs, 64, guard. Gary Eldridge, number 62, guard. Bill Knippen, number 85, end. Bob Burney, number 70, offensive tackle. Mark Schreiber, number 60, guard. Kirk Drew, head football coach for the Lee Volunteers. William Hines, tight end, number 86. Floyd Boone, fullback, number 31, Brighton Ridge Eagle. George Cook, number 74, offense and defensive top. On this Sunday afternoon, eight members of the lead team and coach Kirk Drew meet for the first time with three members of the Brackenridge squad to reflect, reminisce, and remember that historic night in 63. Before now, they've not had a chance to sit down and look at the coach's film of the game, and it was a fun afternoon to hear the stories, the tall tales, and the gridiron gab fest of the game. The teams were not big in those days as they are today. The Lee offensive line averaged just 186 pounds per man. The Eagles tipped the Toledos with an average of 185 pounds per man in the defensive line. But both teams were extremely quick and well coached. The Eagles were coached, of course, by Weldon Foran, who died early in 2002 of a heart attack. Coach Kirk Drew guided the Vols. He went on to become an assistant coach in college. The game has a profound effect on each and every player who took to the turf that magical night and those memories are indelibly inscribed into their minds for a lifetime. Well, it was one of the more exciting times in my life. Uh, we were undefeated. Breckenridge the defending state champions and undefeated. And they had some great personnel. And uh, we had had our defensive linebackers keying on McVeigh running as halfback or tailback. To our surprise, he came out a quarterback. <clears throat> so instead of touching the ball six to 20 times a game, he's going to touch it about 60. We already decided that we would not ever kick off deep. All we're going to do is onside kick. And hopefully we might get one or two, at least maybe they wouldn't get it back to him. Then we also decided that our offense would have the burden to make as many yards as possible because we weren't going to punt because we didn't want to punt to him. And uh, that was our philosophy as far as keeping the ball away from McVeigh. Not to say that Mr. Boone here is not a great football player, but he wasn't quite as fast. It took us a while to even adjust. They had a guy named Coffee that played guard, and he was pretty fast. And they'd pull him out on a bootleg in front of McVeigh. Made it real tough. All of us remember how great it was to have the opportunity at those days when it seemed like high school football in San Antonio was the thing. It was wonderful. Was there any one play that stuck out for you guys? One play? Yeah, any one play that really stuck out? Yeah. Uh, one play that stuck out for me was the fumble Elmo made in the end zone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and the and the fumble that they, they didn't give us that we recovered and they said no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that oh, 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 oh. We gonna ask the replay. He went in there and took that ball from somebody. Well, I think he took it from Melbourne. We both went at it at the same yeah. time. Yeah, uh-huh. And yeah. we did wrestle a little bit. Yeah, you we yeah. wrestled you wrestled all right. You wrestle. took it from him. <laughs> I say, golly. But he was a smaller guy. I know you were bigger. Was that you took that ball? We 
Yeah. yeah. We recovered the fumble. Yeah, right. So there's a little wrestling going on underneath. We're going to have to look at that from another angle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Instant replay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, 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 that's the kickoff. Play that one back. Oh, yeah, we got okay. this. Here's the kickoff. Yeah, that was yeah, the one they wasn't yeah. supposed yeah. to kick was off. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody kicked it off. They kicked it deep. Shouldn't have done that. Watch this. Who they kicked How? They kicked it. She's been waiting all night for this. This tackles this this right yeah here. beautiful well actually the coach uh, talked to us about it out there talked to Warren so I think it was about a, about a week uh, that we we got the information which means that we had to totally change all our offensive scheme uh, and uh, being a team that had won state through sacrificing and and you know nobody wanting to do anything but to be a team player, we learned that whatever it was going to take, we were willing to do it. And one of the things that I know personally that changed for me, I, you know, as a fullback, I got to run up the middle quite a bit, and I ran about quite a few sweeps and things. But when we changed to McVay touching ball, well, he didn't really know the mechanics of handing off of pitching and all of that, so that was just limiting, you know, uh, some of the play, especially in my position. So I turned into mostly a running blocker of most of the game. I got a few blasts up the middle, but for the most part, uh, it really changed our whole offense. Of course, our passing. Uh, Benny Ramon had been a pretty good passer, and uh, of course, he didn't have the skill of, of Victor did the year before, but uh, he was pretty good passing with Warren running the ball. Well, you know, our passing was cut down. And uh, with that in mind, uh, the defense could kind of load up, you know, and uh, they just had to try to chase down Warren, which, as the game told, was not an easy chore, even though you were loading up in the box for him. I'll never forget the fact that after the game, we all met in the center of the field. I don't even think anyone could come together and say, hey, let's meet. I think it just it's, automatically we yeah, all come together. And, and yeah. this was, you say about special, yeah. and, and Floyd put it pretty clearly, but it, it was. It was uh, like the North against the South. It was the uh, have and have not. <coughs> it, it, it was, i never seen 20,000 or more people of all races set up in a, in a stadium, battling one another. Well, we were on the field, but, but uh, there were no, I don't think there were any yes, racial overtones uh, no. on the field as well as in the stands. Right. And after the game, it just blew my mind. You know, we all held hands and mm -hmm. said right. after That's the game. Right. Right. I, I think it taught me a lot of character and, and respect and, and competitive spirit and uh, and I think I try to use that now and as a coach uh, with my kids. Even though there was a large crowd uh, at the game, it was probably one of the first games in his area that televised our on broadcast and radio, and that's a for high school for high school game in this in this area. And that was way back in 1963. Three, three, three which is. You can say Almost that. black and white. Right. <laughs> Am I a black and white? Black and white. <laughs> uh, I think what the game means for me today is uh, uh, the continuation of something that was really important in my adolescence. And uh, I, I, like a lot of other people, were surprised at the, at the numbers that still remember and ask about it. And uh, every time somebody does that, it takes me back to, to a time that was uh, much simpler yeah. and uh, easier in some, some respects. Uh, and it's a pleasant, a pleasant place to go sometimes. It's the last time I really felt like I was confident in who the hell I am. And uh, it's been a struggle ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I think Coach Drew hit it pretty much at the start. It was a different time. The football in San Antonio back in 1963, and with Brackridge being the, the defending state champions, it was a different time. And yet, you know, no one could envision what has taken place 39 years in the past. Uh, having been hurt and not being able to be in that game much, but having been with most of these guys from the seventh grade on, uh, and, and culminating in that game for San Antonio, you just had to have been there. And if you weren't there,